Hello everyone and welcome to the second episode in our three-part panel discussion series on the use of alternative fuels in medium and heavy duty vehicle applications. I'm Nino Dakara, founder of Electric Autonomy Canada, and I'm delighted to introduce the series, which is sponsored by Petro Canada. As more and more businesses are looking to make an impact and reduce their environmental footprint, Petro Canada is proud to introduce an innovative new diesel product to the BC market, Petro Canada Eco Diesel. Petro Canada Eco Diesel is a drop in renewable fuel made with hydro treated renewable diesel that offers the same high performance as conventional diesel, while also reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by up to 84% compared to conventional diesel. To learn more about Petro Canada Eco Diesel, including some real world case studies, visit petro canada.ca forward slash eco diesel. We're grateful to Petro Canada for their support. Well, even if we wanted to, it wouldn't be possible to convert every commercial heavy duty long haul vehicle in the country to a zero emission vehicle today. The supply chain, the vehicles and the infrastructure are unfortunately going to take years to develop for these giant vehicles. That's why alternative fuels are important because we need these huge trucks and other large vehicles to use cleaner fuels today or as soon as possible to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And today's session focuses on just that, the ecosystem to support the use of alternative fuels right now. So how big is the gap between what we have and what we need? We have some outstanding speakers for you today, bringing their expertise to this discussion. And I'm pleased to introduce you to them now. They are Ben Nyland, President and CEO of Loop Energy. Ian Thompson, President, Advanced Biofuels Canada. Stephen Beatty, Vice President, Corporate at Toyota Canada. My colleague, Emma Jarrett, Managing Editor of Electric Autonomy Canada, and she'll be moderating the discussion. Dinara Millington, a Western Network Lead at the Transition Accelerator, who was scheduled to join the panel, is now very unfortunately unable to join us. We hope to invite Dinara back on another occasion. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Emma to commence the discussion. Thank you so much, Nino. Um, welcome, everybody. And before we kick off, I just invite the audience, um, as you're listening to the webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them into the Q&A um, option on your screen rather than the general chat forum. Um, it just helps us to keep better track of everything and hopefully answer your queries at the end of our session. So um, to position us from where we left off yesterday in segment one, we, we stopped on a bit of a cliffhanger talking about the infrastructure needs and how we have a long way to go on some of the, the different um, you know, fueling mechanisms that will be needed to get alternative fuels, be it hydrogen, electric, or biodiesels to consumers. So uh, I'd like us to start, uh, Stephen, perhaps you kick us off with, you know, from your perspective, Toyota has been in at least the hydrogen game for quite a while now. Um, but broadly speaking, you know, what, what do you feel is the real story behind how much infrastructure we will need? on what timeline and, you know, as a country, can we afford to do simultaneously all the different types of infrastructure investments that will be needed to bring all the different fuel types I mentioned to market? Thanks, Emma. You know, one of the, one of the questions that you just posed about Canada is a question that keeps getting posed about Toyota, which is, can we afford to be chasing all sorts of different technologies in order to um, in order to move forward on carbon reduction, but the reality is um, that there are so many different consumers around the world, uh, whether they're industrial customers, whether they're individual uh, drivers, with different needs, different infrastructure in place, um, different use cases for the vehicles that they're driving, that you need to have a very broad range of technology, and frankly, uh, you need to do that to make sure that we're not at risk of having a single uh, energy system um, be overstretched or, 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 or break down on us. So um, yeah, what are the things that we're pursuing in Canada? Obviously, um, 
Toyota is predominantly in the light duty vehicle marketplace, but we have a sister company that produces medium to heavy duty trucks here. Um, a, a global scale, Toyota is involved with buses. We have uh, industrial equipment of various sorts from forklifts through to vehicles that go down into mines. And in all of those cases, you have to look at slightly different um, need cases. Um, but, but let me hone in on hydrogen for a second. Um, it's already the case that we are introducing light duty vehicles in the Canadian marketplace where the, where the infrastructure supports it. And what we're doing in that case is we are, um, um, we're focusing on fleet operators, people whose vehicles operate in constrained spaces uh, where the infrastructure can support them. Either they're coming and going from a base where the fueling exists or they exist in a region where we have sufficient fueling infrastructure in place to support it. Um, but as we look forward, uh, Toyota is going to be going into the production of hydrogen modules here in North America. And those are, those are modules that can be used to help electrify heavy, heavy duty um, vehicles. Again, with those vehicles, our current use case um, has been in, uh, around the port of LA where we've been using hydrogen powered heavy trucks to, um, to handle the sort of logistics around the port and the moving of, of, um, of goods in and out of the port. A, an area where you get big carbon reductions because of the, the sort of stop start cycle and, and heavy loading of those vehicles. But over time, I think you can imagine that uh, on the heavy duty side, we're gonna have to look at uh, providing hydrogen corridors where you know, the, the, heaviest, um, the heaviest volume of transport occurs. Look at those, those corridors first, transform them over, and then from there you start to build out the rest of your network. But, um, but there are plenty of options for us to look at mining sites at all sorts of other places where hydrogen can uh, be supplied on site to, uh, to support vehicle use in, in those constrained spaces. So you don't have to wait for um, an extensive network, you can, you can start it today. And meanwhile, back at the lab, Toyota's busy working on uh, direct combustion hydrogen engines. So there are lots of different opportunities in the road ahead. Thanks, and, and Ian, I'd like to, um, you know, bounce over to you now and, and ask, you know, we, we do hear a lot about electric vehicles, obviously, um, not just in my sphere, but generally they're, they're more commonly seen now. And we certainly know that the government is investing heavily in, in charging infrastructure. And we hear about hydrogen in this, this kind of futuristic almost application. Um, it's not as widely rolled out yet on the passenger segment, at least as um, electric or combustion uh, diesel powered vehicles. But it's coming. But then I feel like biofuels exist in this, you know, quieter area, <laughs> in this middle ground. And I, you know, it'd be great to get your perspective on, you know, what role they play in the larger category of alternative fuels. And, you know, as Stephen was talking about, there are lots of different use applications for these, these types of fuels. So where do you see biofuels fitting in most effectively? Great, thanks, Emma, and thanks to uh, Electro Autonomy for hosting um, uh, what looks to be a really interesting webinar. Um, I think my observation off the top is that the, the technology is moving so quickly in the biofuel space that um, the ethanol and biodiesel that many people associate with biofuel um, are still certainly um, large volumes of those in the market, but the real game changers are what's coming into the market now. And I see it in our membership of 37 companies that are um, developing kind of two classes of fuels or and are already at commercial scale that are really changing the game with things like infrastructure. So um, uh, renewable hydrocarbon fuels, um, and you look at those, uh, people think a oh, hydrocarbon is fossil. Well, it's not, it's a chemical structure. You can make it from a fossil or you can make it from, um, well, you can make it from a number of sorts. You make it from electricity, you can make it from direct air capture. So these um, renewable hydrocarbon fuels um, are, complete drop-in, you can use them 100%. The city of Vancouver is running um, its fleet, I think on, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on Suncor supplied fuel, it's 100% pure renewable diesel fuel on all of their heavy duty fleet. Um, 
airplanes can now run um, that are flying overhead today. In fact, there's an, an IATA map that will show you every airplane today that's running a biofuel in it. Those are obviously modern drop-in fuels that can operate at minus 55 C um, and in fact have better characteristics than a fossil um, jet fuel or kerosene. So that's a huge development. The second one is you have renewable synthetic fuels. Sometimes they're called electrofuels um, and those are now starting to come into commercial scales. They're a little bit behind renewable hydrocarbon. So you can see that that those really change the game when it comes to do we need to build out infrastructure because the answer is no. Um, every vehicle that um, uh, Stevens company produces can run on a renewable gasoline. It's chemically identical to, um, to gasoline, um, diesel fuel, same thing. So the vehicles, the infrastructure are all compatible um, uh, already with those fuels. And uh, even if they were not, um, you're seeing mid-level blends of biodiesel and renewable and uh, ethanol um, in widespread uh, uptake, but we see the real growth coming in those um, drop-in fuels. And um, as to where they fit in the market in the future, um, you look at modeling by the Canadian Climate Institute, you look at the IEA's 2021 modeling of a, a net zero future. You look at the um, Air Resources Board in California's modeling. Um, all of these um, expert modelers assume that by mid-century, we're still going to have huge fleets of internal combustion engines on the road. And if we are to meet our net zero um, targets, we have to have something in those other than today's conventional gasoline, diesel, and jets. So that's really where our fuels come in, you know, for the for the record, I've driven a battery electric vehicle for four years. I'm on my second one. Um, brilliant technology. I think all every time I'm on a road trip, which I do frequently, um, about how does the infrastructure for electrification roll out? It's a complex equation. It's got to happen. Um, so I think there are, we can talk about some of the kind of the overlaps and comp complementarities of um, some of these alternative fuels and how do you address, you know, Stephen's question, how do you address the question of masses, of, you know, billions of dollars into new infrastructure for new fuel types? Um, where do you start? What are the sectors that you most need to target that make most sense? Um, I think those are the kind of questions that we're grappling with today. Great. Well, I would I would love to get into those. Um, perhaps <laughs> Ben, you can kick us off with that. You know, uh, I actually just would love you to walk us through. You know, the the cost associated with creating um, you know fuel cells for commercial use, and then we can get more into you know the issue of of how are we going to finance all of these different um, technologies, and you know make sure that each one is leveraged so we we get the most of the money that's invested. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think the question of cost is, uh, in a way, easily answered. It's, it's a bit pithy, um, but we need to get these new technologies competitive on a total cost of ownership basis with the existing technologies. And and that's maybe not quite as important for, for consumers, but it's definitely the way things are going to roll out for commercial vehicles. Um, at the end of the day, a fleet operator is going to make decisions on what vehicles to deploy based on the total cost they have to incur, the capital cost, the operating cost over time. Um, and factored into that is, is not just what the vehicle costs me and the fuel, although those are the biggest costs, there's also the infrastructure piece. And if you're operating a fleet, so whether you're a municipal bus operator or uh, a logistics fleet operator like UPS, Amazon, or FedEx, you have to think about that whole ecosystem. And when you're looking at these different infrastructure pieces, um, there are costs associated with getting the initial vehicles on the road. And so what we see with battery electric commercial vehicles is they're very quick to get one or two up and running uh, as a pilot fleet. Um, but then they run into a couple of key issues that really affect the total cost of ownership, which is uh, the, the cost of reduced cargo. So typically they tend to be heavier, which means those vehicles take less cargo. Uh, and then as fleet operators who, are, who maybe are looking at refueling fleets of hundreds or uh, more of vehicles, start looking at the electrical transmission requirements. Uh, that starts to become very cost prohibitive and in some cases not even possible. So I just stepped out of a, another conference here for a few minutes where we were talking about port, the port logistics of getting 
uh, electricity into a major port here in Vancouver is virtually impossible to electrify what's going on in the port. And so then you're looking at opportunities like biofuels and like hydrogen, right? And when we look in California, there's existing hydrogen infrastructure in many, many places, especially ports today. Uh, anywhere there's a refining operation, there's hydrogen production. Uh, and in the port in California, there's actually a pipeline that goes right through it. And so our approach uh, with Loop is we're very TCO focused. So we develop all of our products on total cost of ownership models for, for commercial vehicles. And we focus on sectors that are ready to adopt today or close proximity to hydrogen and have the ability to scale. And I think that's what's going to be most critical as we look at these alternative fuels and where to deploy them. Uh, there's an ease of deployment and then there's a total cost of deployment. And in many scenarios, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles make a tremendous amount of sense. Uh, the operating cost is approaching uh, what you can have with diesel. Uh, the capital cost has some, some way to go, uh, but that's not surprising. Diesel engines have benefited from 100 years of supply chain optimization. Uh, fuel cells are just getting started. So, so we really see those sectors of commercial vehicles and specifically return to base commercial vehicles like buses, drayage trucks, logistics vehicles. Uh, being where the costs are going to reach parity the fastest and that's you know ultimately we can have government programs that subsidize a certain amount of initial deployment but broader adoption is going to depend on meeting the economic requirements so that the end users are the ones that are actually financing the transition yeah it's such an interesting um issue i'm it was it was touched on yesterday um and i would really love to get the group's thoughts on on this um, matter of what I, you know, called last mile delivery of, of alternative fuels, um, and you know, getting them from you know the the spot where the hydrogen is made or the alternative fuel is blended, and then dispensing it to those you know end user locations. And it was described yesterday as like a hub and spoke model. So I'd really like to know from the group what your thoughts are on that. Is do you think that's a viable idea and a, a a goal we should be going after to sort of reconfigure how we we distribute alternative fuels. Feel free to kick off. Yeah, those thoughts. <laughs> I can I can wade in um, and, and and just um, building off um, Ben's um, observations. Um, we see a real fit between, for instance, hydrogen and advanced biofuels. So. Um, and we've given this feedback to a couple of um, uh, of governments in their consultations. The um, in alternative fuels, you always run into this chicken and egg thing. How can you get um, consumers to buy electric vehicles if they're they perceive to be a lack of um, charging infrastructures? So then you have to build out all of this charging infrastructure in advance of having enough vehicles. You think that kind of someone's got to be the chicken. Um, so in the case of hydrogen, um, the, the current refining industry uses huge volumes of hydrogen. And when you think about hydro treating or hydro processing, that's all using hydrogen to stabilize the, the long chain carbons that make up our, our um, hydrocarbon fuel. So um, we need lots of low CI hydrogen. And you know whether it's blue, green, or what pink or turquoise, the top of the different colors that are coming out right now, it's carbon intensity is really the critical metric. If we can use low CI hydrogen to produce lower carbon intensity gasoline and diesel and jet today, or we can use them in facilities that are producing renewable hydrocarbon fuels, they become a critical part to lowering the overall carbon intensity. And what they can do for the hydrogen is you can get the production of hydrogen up and running at scale, bring the economics down, that hydrogen can in part go into fuel refining while the infrastructure to build out um, the kinds of scenarios that Ben is describing, whether it's um, out and back, um, whether it's corridors and hydrogen, um, I think those can be really complementary and it can really um, give a foundation for hydrogen as an example to build up the capacity for the hydrogen itself um, and not have this dead end. And we've run into that in biofuels. You build 
um, you have these mandates and that you don't have enough uh, fuel to fill them or you build a plant, but you don't have a market because you don't have a mandate. And we, those are all of the challenges and we need to solve those um, issues if we're going to get the alternatives really off the ground. And in the case of hydrogen electrification, the role that they have to play, um, we have to have them. We can't, you can't um, get to net zero with advanced biofuels or renewables and that. You just can't, there's not enough, can't do it quickly enough or not enough. We need all of the fuels. Well, and, and, and Ian, I think you've hit on something that's really important here. And that is that um, when we talk about hydrogen, it's not, you know, the, the small part of this that is um, vehicle fuels is quite apart from the issue of what's going to, you know, what's going to be necessary for hydrogen to be successful. It's, it's, we're talking about a broad based energy transformation and an energy carrier or a chemical that can, you know, support a wide range of, of end uses beyond transportation. So even when it comes to our manufacturing operations, we have high heat uh, processes. Those, those can be run with hydrogen burners in our, in our factories. But that means having to have the supply of industrial scale hydrogen where we're, where we're doing those manufacturing operations. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to get at is this, um, the success of hydrogen and its ability to, to drive down you know, unit cost is going to be more complex than just will we have heavy duty transport running on, on hydrogen. It's going to be a whole host of factors working in favor of, of making the trans transformation to hydrogen. On the flip side of this, I think you in the transportation space have hit on a very important issue. And that is as manufacturers, whether in, we're in the light or heavy duty space, we're being asked to make very, very rapid changes in technology in order to drive down tailpipe emissions. And uh, invariably those policies are built on new vehicle sales. But the reality is that, trans that emissions from transportation are based on um, you know, carbon kilometers traveled. And that means the entire fleet on the road. So our ability to find you know, synthetic fuels or other options, including biofuels to drop the carbon emissions of vehicles on the road today is really incredibly important. So I, I think you know, this is not an either or situation. This is as we're busy pushing the boundaries on some new technologies and transportation, we all collectively have to look at what we do with the existing uh, the existing fleet and how we green it up. Yeah, and I'd maybe just add uh, to that. I think there's a there's a human uh, desire to find the one silver bullet solution and figure out what the one solution is. Um, this is very complex. I'd, I'd echo what Stephen said. The good news is we've got a lot of really smart people working in all these different areas, and and the way in which this problem gets solved probably looks different than the way it was solved in the past, right? So the idea of a central refining uh, location that manufactures hydrogen and distributes it across the country to the vehicles is probably not the way this is going to go. Um, but we're seeing in, as, as Ian described, you know, offtake from refining operations that are greening their hydrogen production creates a great opportunity to give uh, vehicles access to lower cost hydrogen because it's being produced in scale. In, in Europe, we're seeing this in, in terms of greening uh, the production of steel. So big industrial applications to provide hydrogen to steel operations to use instead of natural gas uh, provides an abundant source of inexpensive green hydrogen and small amounts of that can be taken off to, to fuel vehicles at uh, hydrogen costs that actually make it make sense. And that's the way it's starting there. And all the way at the other end of the spectrum, I had a conversation with a, quite a large company from Germany a few weeks ago that was talking about what is effectively hydrogen microgrids that they're looking at, where uh, they, they have small deployments that put electrolyzers in place at renewable energy installations, whether that's wind or solar, and use the curtailed energy to put it into a, a localized hydrogen pipeline that can be used either as an energy backup device, fuel cells can be used to provide energy if, if, uh, if needed to balance out the grid, or that hydrogen can be used for vehicles, whether it's agricultural vehicles, cars, trucks, what have you. Again, creative solutions that you'd never expect to come up in an internal combustion world, but because people are now thinking about this problem differently, we're seeing some really interesting solutions. Uh, and so it's hard to know exactly how this is going to shake out, but there's a lot going on. 
That's really fascinating. I didn't know that, that you could um, make microgrids out of hydrogen, essentially. It, it kind of reminds me of what I've been hearing with electric vehicles and, and turning them into distributed energy resources like the, the DERs and having it you know, way down the, <laughs> down the line, but the potential to have neighborhood grids based off of, of EVs. But I didn't realize you could do it with hydrogen too. We'll see. It's an idea right now, but it's, I think it's a good one. <laughs> so Stephen, I just wondering, um, could you expand a little bit more on, on your comment? You know, we have to look at, at the existing fleet and how we, we green it up and, and give deeper insight into what you meant specifically and, and maybe what Toyota's role in that is. I, I'm sorry. You know what? Uh, just as we were doing that, my Wi-Fi uh, took a little bit of a hiccup. So if you could repeat the question, that'd be great. Sure, no problem. Uh, you said in your your last answer, you know, we have to look at the existing fleet and how we're going to green it up. Sure. And I was wondering if you could go deeper on that. All right. Well, I'll give you a light duty vehicle um, example, um, but but the the problem's worse at uh, at heavy duty. Um, we've got uh, roughly 24 million vehicles on the road in Canada at the moment, and in a given year, we bring. Um, well, I, I would guess this year we might bring 1.4 million new vehicles on the road. Um, what's been happening is that the actual market for vehicles has been increasing quite dramatically over the last decades. Um, so 1.4 on doesn't mean 1.4 off. Um, the, the fleet just continues to grow. And as a result, even as we're gaining new efficiency in our vehicles, um, overall carbon emissions from transportation have been growing. So the reality of this is that um, if we're trying to solve this simply through new vehicle release into the market, uh, we're gonna be at this for a very, very long time. And that's why governments have been arguing for extraordinarily accelerated um, release of zero emission vehicles is because to get to 2050, you effectively have to have your fleet zeroed out by 2035. Now, there's an enormous cost associated with that. Imagine instead what, what happens if you are able to drop an e-fuel into existing vehicles and drop the carbon footprint of that $24 million, the 24 million unit fleet today. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I think it's important for us to point to um, where the greatest savings can come from, uh, you know, from deploying technologies or fuels and uh, certainly in the transportation space, heavy and medium duty applications are very important because of the, um, you know, the, the large point source emissions from those vehicles. Um, and if we're waiting for new technology to solve it all, um, there is a natural turnover in that fleet. Um, so if we can begin to look at, um, at biofuels, at synthetic fuels, at other options that help as the new vehicle fleet is bringing new technologies to market, that's going to be very, very important. Great, thank you. And um, before we were in the last fifteen minutes or so of our our you know Q and A discussion, so I would encourage the audience if you have anything that you've heard that you want to know more about later on, please throw it in the Q and A chat. Um, but Stephen, your your last comments um, dovetail nicely into something I am really curious to get the groups thoughts on, which is how do you all feel um, about the level of education we have as a country on all the different fuel options? Um, you know, I mentioned some more populous ones earlier and then, you know, said my impression is that certain biofuels or biodiesel kind of live in this quieter corner. So I'd be more interested, though, to hear your perspectives, you know, when you're going out into the, the um, world with, you know, your technologies or your um, your goals to get renewables or lower carbon fuels into vehicles. Um, what is the level of knowledge, understanding, awareness of, of the options we have available? So, uh, I've got a very quick answer for that. You know, we're going we're going after commercial vehicles, and, and I would say the fleet operators uh, have become very well educated in the alternatives, at least from our perspective over the last few years. I mean, when you have um, companies like Amazon setting up a hydrogen strategy department uh, in the company, they're educating themselves on this. They want to understand what the alternatives are so they're making good decisions. 
Um, and, and so we're finding that uh, our customers, our end customers are very well educated on what's going on. Regulators are getting better and, and governments are really educating themselves on this. Uh, so that's just from a hydrogen perspective, that's what we're seeing. Yeah, I would, I would, uh, I would concur. I think different sectors are better informed. We're working with a number of heavy duty sectors right now that are are coming up to speed pretty quickly on um, the alternatives. I think, I'm um, to your comments. The the technology is moving at least in our space faster than um, the understanding of it um, of amongst people who are making policy decisions and. Um, you know, California's low carbon fuel standard is a great case in point when, you know, California was putting that together in the late, um, well, before it came into force in 2010, there were huge assumptions that electric vehicles and cellulosic ethanol were going to be really big contributors to that standard. Well, fast forward a decade, um, cellulosics never got off the ground and EVs have had a slower start, notwithstanding that California, like BC and uh, Quebec, um, have a ZEV mandate. So our assumptions about who's going to show up um, need to be pretty carefully thought through. And I, um, this is why you know performance-based standards um, are pretty pretty critical. Um, identify what it is that you want to have as an outcome, um, and then let the market go after that. Versus saying here's the technology that is going to win the day. Um, it kind of does an end run around the market's ability to show up with the, um, the lowest cost, um, most ready to come to market solution. So um, if that, that would be one area where I think we need to continue to educate policy staff to go for performance, not necessarily a technology. And I would say that in the case, by the way, of biofuels, it's, it's appropriate that we are moving beyond standards that say you have to blend this kind of biofuel into gasoline or diesel. That may have been appropriate a decade ago when those were the only things available. We shouldn't be doing that anymore. We should be doing things like low carbon fuel standard where hydrogen and renewable natural gas and electrification, all of those um, get a, an equal kick at the can. So, so I, I, I think you both hit on a key issue, which is commercial operators understand their business. They understand the dollars and cents of it. They understand how they use their vehicles. And they're very quickly educating themselves on the on the technologies that are available to them or the fuels to be able to you know meet their business or environmental goals. Um, with respect to regulators, you're also right. There tends to be a um, a tilt toward predicting or to, to to requiring not only the outcome but also the the uh, the modalities that you're going to use in order to arrive at those outcomes. And that's where things get complicated and expensive. But frankly, some of that comes from a public misunderstanding of the technologies and, and, and the energy sources. And so uh, I'm sorry to keep introducing the light duty side into this, but it's actually important for us to get alternative fuels, alternative technologies into the hands of the public in one form or another, so that they can start to educate themselves on, on how well some of these alternatives actually perform. Um, and it's why, um, although we understand that there are great benefits in, in uh, bringing hydrogen fuel cell technology, for example, to heavy duty transport, that we've got um, our Mirai fuel cell vehicle in use with the lift, uh, you know, ride hailing fleet in, in BC. It's because everybody who rides in the back seat of one of those cars uh, starts to learn about the technology, how it applies, and the fact that it actually performs really well. Um, so I think. You know, for all of us who are invested in one form or another, new technology or new fuels or new energy sources, um, there's, a, there's an onus on us to help educate the public because that sets the context in which public policy can be made. Yeah, it's so interesting giving people like a real world experience, um, you know, where they can touch, feel, understand it for themselves. And yeah, I think you've all mentioned, um, you know, sort of in passing these, these real world um, cases where alternative fuels have been put into use, um, some successes, some not, but I'm wondering, you know, if you're, if you're talking to people and trying to educate them, what examples are you pointing to of that worked really well? Let's try to do that again here in this case, or conversely, that was a 
that was an idea that didn't go as well as we thought it might. And let's, uh, you know, what did we learn to not do again? Stealing shamelessly is, um, should not be um, an exercise in shame. So um, there are great real, real world examples out there. Um, so California, um, I don't think anybody would argue that California doesn't have a, an assertive stance on climate. Um, so California's low carbon fuel standard, again, has been in place for over a decade. It got a slow start as these mandates do. They kind of get off the ground. The industry got um, accustomed to how they work. The markets developed and the markets for the credits in these standards become critical. Um, and in, in the case of California, it took about a five year period for renewable content in the diesel fuel, for instance, in the diesel pool, for instance, to go from about 5% to 30 so fully uh, zoning, zeroing in on a third of um, all of the diesel fuel in California now is in some renewable content. It might be renewable natural gas. It might be biodiesel. It might be renewable diesel. But it just shows you the rapidity um, with which you can transform a whole sector. And there um, is now um, underway uh, construction of sufficient capacity in California alone by Marathon and by Philip 66 and others to displace all of the gasoline, all this, pardon me, all of the diesel in California in a few years' time with renewable content every last gallon. Will that happen? You know, it'll probably go to other markets. That's how quickly things can, can move. Um, and so I, I think we need to we need to um, let go of the old assumptions. It's a bit like the smartphone. People use that analogy probably a little bit too often, but the iPhone in your hand is, didn't exist 10 years ago. So um, we our forward-looking views tend to be out of date with where the technologies are going. And I think we just need to leave ourselves open to it without um, get going so far as to say, well, these unicorns are going to save us and we'll develop something. Um, but by the same token, the catalytic converter didn't exist until California mandated tailpipe regulations. So that was a technology response to um, a mandate. Yeah, I, I think I, I'd echo that. I mean, California, from a regulatory perspective, it has repeatedly um, sort of pushed the industry in directions that we've all benefited from over the last several decades. Um, we're seeing in other jurisdictions, not really North America yet, I'm still hoping for this, uh, a, a more immediate alignment of the value chain around our market, which is commercial vehicles. And I would say I absolutely agree with Stephen's statement that we all need to get these in front of consumer vehicles. Loop's just not in position to do that today. Uh, but we're seeing an alignment of regulators vehicle manufacturers and fleet operators in Europe and China that we're not yet seeing in North America. And, and I think that that has a lot to do with uncertainty around the political situation in the states and big companies not necessarily wanting to make a bet that the current trend towards uh, emissions will, will remain as it is if there's a change in the Senate or, or the presidential occupants. Um, and, and so it's difficult, I think, for companies to really commit to that uh, and fleet operators and, and vehicle manufacturers. And so California has consistently set that down, I think, to the extent Canada can, can be consistent uh, and set up an environment that allows companies like Toyota to say, OK, when Canada decides to do something, they're going to do it the same way I'm sure Toyota looks at California and says, OK, they put this mandate in place. We need to move that will help the value chain align and Canada can probably learn lessons from what California has done in terms of providing that kind of stability and, and path forward for companies to make decisions. So in that context, let me just throw a, you know, this, this idea that there are closer to home examples of some success and, you know, the, the clean energy uh, standard in, uh, in BC, for example, was largely responsible for the establishment of, uh, of uh, hydrogen dispensers in, in the lower mainland. Um, and what that was, was an opportunity to move, move carbon reduction credits from you know, one stream to another. And uh, I guess this has been the number one argument that we've made with the, uh, with the federal government in particular. And that is, um, if we're looking at transportation as a whole, 
because you know typically we talk about transportation and it's uh, 24 percent you know uh, uh, contribution to carbon emissions in this country um, you know that's good we can talk about it at that level as a debating point but then we start to, to segment it uh, sector by sector application by application uh, size of vehicle commercial use whatever and the credits from carbon reduction don't you know they're not tradable across all of those pillars so it, it leaves and you know a um, sort of economically inefficient model for us to get the right technologies and energies to the right places to get the biggest bang for everybody's buck um, bc in a limited span um, you know demonstrated that that sort of movement of credits uh, can work we need to kind of um, rediscover that and apply it on a national scale and you know, I, I really appreciate that that Canadian example, Stephen. I think, um, you know, definitely it always maybe feels a little nicer when it's kind of like a made in Canada solution. I don't know, but you know, we we can't ignore the fact that the U.S. does have a massive impact on everything that happens here. Um, which, you know, one of our audience questions was actually about that. So I'm just going to bring that one in early. Um, we had somebody ask. Can you talk about the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act impact on hydrogen ad adaptation acceleration in the U.S. and what it could mean for Canada and Canada's ability to deliver hydrogen competitively? So different kind of market question. Um, all right. So you know, a lot of that related to um, the thrust of the uh, of U.S. legislation to try to develop. Um, the, the battery supply chain and battery production um, network in, in the United States and to, you know, frankly, move the, the, the center of, uh, of, um, of um, you know, development from China to, uh, to North America. And you would think that something that was so heavily focused on battery electrics would necessarily mean that it would set back everybody else. But the reality of it is, in fact, it takes a long time to get that supply chain up and running. So um, when we start looking at manufacturing of goods in North America and a trade agreement and then incentives that are, you know, that, that have very high hurdles that you have to overcome in order to be able to either get tariff-free enter entry of goods or access to consumer incentives from the US government, um, one way to do that, obviously, is to focus in very directly on, on the requirements of those regulations. Another one is to say, well, there are parts of the market that frankly weren't affected by it. And where um, when you're looking at regional value content for trade purposes and so forth, there may be greater benefit than in accelerating hydrogen fuel cell development or other activities. Or in the case of um, conventional technologies, moving faster on synthetic fuels or you know true true biofuels um, may be beneficial in terms of of our manufacturing base and being able to get get product into market around some of those constraints that have been set up by policy so uh there's there's always the straight line effect which is what are the rules and how do you comply and then there's the um th then there's the practical reality that somebody's going to look at the rules and identify where the gaps are and point directly at those gaps and start to develop the, the, the business opportunities. Ben or Ian, do you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, the Americans have typically been more assertive and more generous in their on the fiscal side with respect to getting new technologies off the ground. The um, the IRA um, continues that tradition. Um, and it's certainly in our sector, there's considerable talk about Canada needing to up its game to stay on a competitive basis. Um, the members in our organization are large companies. They have to make money to stay afloat. Um, they will put their production and assets into markets that make a return. So if the U.S. Um, has more generous um or, or, or more readily accessible funding packages. Uh, it's not just the amount, it's how easy it is to get, get access to them. Um, people are gonna put their production there. So our work really here is to make sure that Canada has a domestic industry. It doesn't service very well if we 
move from reliance on one energy type um, to reliance on foreign supply for all of our fuels. So um, yeah, without getting into details, the um, there are some concerns on this side of the border about certain provisions in the IRA. Um, and some of them, in fact, are probably not trade compliant. That may or may not have any bearing. Um, but Canada's got to get, I think, you, you see the support for these technologies by Canadians will become stronger when they can see them, touch them, feel them. So, Steve and I drove by the first Mirai, you know, a month ago on the streets of, of Vancouver. We, I, I drive by the hydrogen fuel stations uh, down on, uh, you know, on, on uh, Granville and out in North Vancouver. You, people have got to see this stuff. They've got to see the jobs that come from it. Um, small rural communities, foresters, farmers, they need to be benefiting from these because they're not zero cost. Um, it's going to cost us to take on climate. People are willing to take that on if they can see some benefit from it. Uh, I don't have a job now doing this, but I can get a job in this. Okay. Or I can actually see in my community um, a facility or investments. So that is critical. So we, we, we've got to have domestic production in Canada. Yeah, and, and I would just say I'm, I'm taking a bit of a wait and see at, uh, view on, on what the IRA does. And, and Stephen's point about finding the gaps or finding the niches is very much Loop's approach to things. So we see government incentives as being critically important. But at the end of the day, we look for sectors and applications where e even if it is not cost effective in the immediate term, there's a clear path to, to an economic a positive net economic outcome. Uh, and sometimes government incentives can hide that or, or smooth over and push you into areas that aren't viable over the longer term. And so we tend to be very careful about developing strategy around policy like the IRA. We, we prefer to look at the underlying fundamentals of the market. The benefit of uh, IRA and stuff like that is if it brings the alignment of the value chain that I was talking about before and starts moving the industry forward, that will be fantastic for everybody. Yeah. Sorry, just, just from the consumer marketplace though, Emma, I, I just want to leave a warning with everybody and that is, um, you know, incentives are very popular with people. Uh, if I get free money from the government, well, that's a banner day. Well, I mean, the problem is it's never free and it doesn't last for long. And um, an incentive is an incentive. The moment it goes away, the market starts to change again. And frankly, the success of these programs uh, has with it baked in it, uh, the very reasons that it'll fail in the long term, which is they just become too expensive. So again, it goes back to this issue of, um, it's much better to have outcome-based policy making. There's point everybody in the direction that you want to go rather than attempting to pull individual levers because you'll get all sorts of perverse impacts of public policy that way. Um, but there are opportunities and as long as we're on the subject of, of medium and heavy duty transport, there are more opportunities in that sector than there are in light duty transport for the Canadian marketplace to be important and to support the growth of, uh, of domestic operations. Um, so I, I, I think let's, let's look for the opportunities. Let's ensure that we have a strong base in Canada. And then of course, uh, our biggest export market is just next door. So that you know, if we're stronger here, we'll be stronger as we approach the US. Yeah. yeah, it's it's critical. I'll just just leverage off what Stephen is saying. We poll our members on a pretty regular basis about which of the policy instruments are most important to them. And um, yes, a production credit can be a nice thing, but as Stephen points out, when it goes away, you're fighting to get it back. The most critical thing is um, a consistent, strong signal for the use of your product. Um, if I produce this, could me show me that I can use it and. Um, and we need those kind of mandates. We have an incumbent energy sector that um, understandably is, is, wants to maintain its primacy. You have to have mandates to say, you know, you've got to reduce the carbon intensity of your fuels. Um, the second biggest thing, in, and, and we've had, we discussed this across the political spectrum in Canada, when we're talking with opposition parties who say, well, we're going to get rid of that policy, 
um, we say that is the worst possible signal you could send to the sector and you can send to the global investment community, which is Canada is doing this. You know, when the first thing that happened in Ontario when the Ford government dropped cap and trade, that didn't send a positive signal. Whether you agree with cap or trade or not, it is pick a pick an instrument and 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 work it, but keep it. So if we drop a policy, that's horrible. Um, investment um, uh, sentiment is going to go down, and not just in our sector, but across the whole, uh, across all sectors. So people want constancy. So don't drop a policy, improve it. Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting human psychology thing. You know, we're all faced with new technology, a new way of living, a new way of doing things. Like what we cling to is the security of, you know, it's all going to be okay. So I, I think the consistency is, is um, a very interesting component of this. And, you know, one of our other questions, not, it's kind of a consistency, but, but also just about putting um, control, I guess, back in the hands of the consumer is, what is preventing fully renewable fuels from becoming available for retail purchase by consumers beyond the regulated ethanol and biodiesel blends? More choice at the pump could help build demand and lower costs in the long term. Does anyone have any feedback on that? <laughs> Well, at the risk of being the person who talks too much, I'll say one more thing. Um, carbon pricing can be pretty important for all of us. Um, and carbon pricing essentially looks to um, address the disparity between the climate costs of a fossil fuel and the lower climate impacts of a low carbon fuel. And um, so carbon pricing needs to work. If carbon pricing works well, consumers can look at that and they can look at the price in the pump or they can look at um, the benefits of driving an EV um, or the lower costs of operating a fleet on hydrogen. So we, we need to make sure that some of the things that are not um, uh, use mandates also work. And carbon pricing is one of them. BC right now has got a brilliant low carbon fuel program, um, but BC right now uh, charges the same carbon tax on a biofuel or a renewable synthetic fuel as it does on gasoline and diesel. They know that that's not correct. They know that they've screwed up the regulation, but they need the political will to fix it. Consumers are missing a signal in BC that would accelerate them even further toward um, choice of the pump um, because they don't see the price in the pump reflecting that a biofuel is lower carbon. It's the same cost. So we've got some, some tweaks we need to do. Ben, Stephen, do you want to add anything? Well, I, I, I do think that whole issue of synth fuel is re really important. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's an emerging technology. It's expensive today. Um, but automakers around the world, along with, uh, along with energy suppliers, are busy looking at it and trying to understand how to, you know, how to bring those, those fuels to market. Um, so it, part of it is a maturity issue of some of the technology. Part of it is, um, you know, difference in the way that uh, the different technologies are taxed, as, as Ian has mentioned, um, and we see that right down to the level of the vehicle. Um, you have some taxes on on internal combustion vehicles that don't that simply don't exist on electric vehicles today, but we know are going to have to be applied in some fashion in the future. So the market is going to change over time, and the cost structure is going to going to change, and that will naturally bring about some of the some of the differences that that your your, uh, your your question addresses in terms of what does it take to get hydrogen for example into a pump uh wow a lot of things um but one of them and i think maybe the most important one is to be able to demonstrate that there is sufficient local demand to get the dispenser in place to be able to deliver that hydrogen and that's why this focus on, on commercial applications is really important because these are the people who will reliably use those volumes of hydrogen day in, day out. And that becomes the backbone for creating a bigger, uh, a bigger hydrogen infrastructure over time. And it's why, at least in the light duty space, we focused on, on ride hailing and package delivery and so forth. It's because those are activities that are repeatable. They operate in a, in a restricted geographic region. 
and it creates this sort of virtuous circle with hydrogen producers to, uh, you know, to get the hydrogen on site. Um, it doesn't work if you think that we're going to be able to take the existing model and simply, you know, change gasoline out for hydrogen. It doesn't that 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 that's not the that's not the plan, and uh, um, and it's why these various energy alternatives have to coexist. Great. Um, well, we have like 30 seconds left, but Ian, I wanted to just get you to repeat the answer you gave to the person that asked how much cleaner are renewable hydrocarbons than traditional fossil fuels. I think it went to them directly, but it's a great question. We developed a website about a year ago called Net Zero cleanfuels.ca and we provide all of the data there about what biofuels are doing currently in British Columbia two years ago the average carbon intensity of biodiesel for instance was minus three grams so it's already the biodiesel coming into BC is already a net zero fuel um, on a full life cycle carbon basis so um, the technologies are moving incredibly fast you attach bioenergy carbon and capture and storage to an ethanol plant, you drop its carbon intensity by 25% in one step. So the technologies are moving so quickly um, and everybody has got the net zero message clearly. So um, our sector is um, putting huge amounts of that effort into becoming even lower carbon. Great. Well, thank you so much. We, we've hit the end of our, our chat, but it was great to have you all on, Ben, Ian, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing your, your wisdom. It's greatly appreciated. And I will pass back to Nino now. Well, and thank you very much to, uh, to you, Emma, for, for moderating the discussion. And, and just uh, I want to add my special thanks to the panelists again for making the time and to come on, on board and, and share their expertise with the audience. Ian, Stephen and Ben, that was a really terrific discussion with some phenomenal uh, thoughts and insights. Um, I, I would like and also just a big thanks to the audience for taking part. We had um, great, great registrations and fewer questions. And I'd also like to thank our sponsor, presenting sponsor once again, Petro Canada, for coming on board to really enable this uh, conversation to take place. We will be sharing a link to a recording of the webinar in the in the next few days on electricautonomy.ca. If you register to if you register to our newsletter, um, you will receive a link uh, through through the newsletter for sure. Uh, tomorrow uh, we continue with the third of our three sessions at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific, and uh, this this episode will feature a a, a new set of panelists. Uh, on an evolving uh, uh, line of topic uh, around uh, obviously the use and deployment of alternative fuels. So please do register for that one if you haven't already. You do need to register for it individually. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs>